Wow. Wow. Okay, quiet all of a sudden. <laughs> Ephesians. Chapter 4. Verse 11 to 14. This is week number 3 on this passage of Scripture. Ephesians 4, 11 to 14. And he himself gave some to the apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints for the work of ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. Till we all come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God and a perfect man, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we should no longer be children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the trickery of men and the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting. So we spent two weeks so far on the work of ministry and the equip and the purpose of all of these spiritual gifts is to equip you for the work of ministry as each and every one of you are ministers. Yeah. Okay. And for the edifying or the building up of the church. Now, last week I left you with a question. Anyone remember what it was? Yes? What are you going to do to minister this week? If we want to grow up. That's right. Up. Pardon? If we want to grow up. <laughs> yes, that was one of the questions, and, and you have continually said no. I'm <laughs> sticking to it. So what are you going to do in the next 168 hours which is seven days, that would be considered the work of ministry. So this week I want to ask, what have you done that would be considered the work of ministry? And I want you to think about that. I don't need a, a verbal response right now, but I want us to be thinking of what are we doing to further the kingdom of God as ministers of the gospel, which every Born again believer is a minister. Yes. Yes. Right? Mm -hmm. yes. I got one yes. 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 Good. Yeah. Amen. I'm still thinking. <laughs> <laughs> you may be a minister, but how it comes across is another thing. All right, let's move on. The last, well, okay. The last two weeks we focused on the two things. God has placed us, placed these spiritual gifts in the church for the work of ministry and for the edifying of the body of Christ. We also saw that every believer is a minister. And I like that. I really like that, that each of us is a minister. Every born again Christian, again, has a job to do, and that is to encourage the body of Christ and to build up the church. Now, verse 13 says, keep all that in mind, and then go to verse 13, says, till we all come to the unity of the faith. Now, picture with me. Just a few people being in unity. You with me so far? Can you picture a group of people that are in unity? Think about that. Take two people with different political views. Pretty hard to get them in unity, isn't it? You believe one way, you're not going to go this way, and if this person believes that way, they're not going to change their views. People being in unity. If you took two politicians, you'd have fireworks. You wouldn't have unity, you would have fireworks. Just a few weeks ago, Lynn and I had lunch out on a Sunday afternoon after church 
Someone stopped at our table in the restaurant and informed me if I would change the day of our church, they would come to our church. <laughs> now, I didn't tell them I'd, I'd start a service on Saturday, too. But <laughs> Unity is so elusive. Even in the body of Christ. But we must remember it says unity of the faith. It's not saying that we agree on everything. It says unity of the faith. But the key is agreeing or unity concerning the truth of God's word. That's where it comes together at. When we are acting in unity, as the body of Christ must, and if we are, the body is invincible. If we are in unity, it's incredible what God can do through people that are in unity. In a Peanuts cartoon, Lucy demanded that Linus change TV channels, threatening him with her fist if he didn't do it. <clears throat> Linus said, what makes you think you can walk right in here and take over? Lucy said, these five fingers. <laughs> Individually, they're nothing. But when I curl them up together, just like this, into a unified fist, they form a weapon that is terrible to behold. Which channel do you want, Linus says. And he looks at his fingers and says, why can't you guys get unified like that? And as we grow together in Christ, and as we mature in Christ, unity will come. Now, every time you look at your hand, you're going to be thinking of unity now, right? As we grow in unity, God makes the whole body fitly, fit perfectly together as we grow in unity. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 3, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in a bond of peace. In other words, it's work to have unity. Endeavoring, that's work. Striving to have unity in the body of Christ. If we were to attempt to describe Christian unity... I would say we have unity because of what we share in common. One body, one spirit, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, and one Father. Mm -hmm. Speaking of unity, I, I think of Philippians chapter 3, verses 13 to 15, it says, Brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended, but one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead. Amen. I press toward. Amen. I press toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Yes. Unity, as I said already, takes work. I have to press for that. I have to work for that. I don't count myself as having been already attained that. I'm not perfect. I'm not there yet. But we want to press on. Amen. Keep your eyes on the goal. Amen. Keep focusing ahead. Amen. Keep moving forward. Amen. In this case, I would say this is an encouragement to keep working towards the goal of unity. Don't give up. Amen. That's right. Don't quit. 
Now the next thing in verse 13, we'll keep in, keep in mind till we all come to unity. Then you can say, till we all come to a perfect man. It's another very difficult thing, isn't it? Is anyone here perfect? I have had people raise their hands before. <laughs> till we all come to a perfect man. In Hebrews, or in Matthew chapter 5, verse 48, it says, Be perfect as your Father in heaven is perfect. And the instant thought that comes to my mind is, yeah, right. I haven't met a perfect person yet. Christian or not. You're asking something, God, that's impossible. So why should I even try? If someone told me that years ago, I would respond with, if God didn't think it was possible, he wouldn't have put it in God's word. It wouldn't be in the Bible. Wow. You ever think about that? Never thought about that. Be perfect as your Father in heaven is perfect. So if God didn't think it was possible, it wouldn't be there. So now you're thinking, where's this guy going with this? He would, we would probably say it means God was without sin, so we should be without sin. Therefore, we would be perfect. All right, here we go. The word perfect comes from the Greek word teleos, best as I could pronounce it, which literally means complete or mature. So what have we been talking about? We've been talking about growing up. We've been talking about maturing in the Lord. So when Jesus said, be perfect as your Father in heaven is perfect, he was actually saying, grow up to be like your heavenly Father. As a Christian, it means Christ-like. So we want to become Christ-like. In so doing, we're becoming mature or perfect in that sense. Doesn't mean perfect in the sense that we as English-speaking people think of. It means for us to mature and grow in our walk with God. Growing up as Christians. We should be striving to be more like Jesus at all times. Yes. Yes. And as you continue reading chapter 4, he wants the church to grow up, meaning to mature, and to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we no longer be children and we are to grow up in every way. Ouch, there's another tough one. Every aspect of our life we need to be growing up in. <clears throat> to some, hearing that hurts. Because again, we feel like that's impossible. So many people don't want to grow up. But in sincerity, sincerity, I feel like that not wanting to grow up is not necessarily in our walk with God. Maybe in the natural. But my desire is to always be growing in my walk with God. Acts chapter 2, verse 42 says, We're told the early church devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. Back then, that's what they had to do to be taught. Now we would say, read God's word. Read the Word of God. See what God Amen. has for you. Amen. It's all written right here in this book. That's right. 
The only way we grow up is to listen to the word and put it into action in our lives. Acts chapter 17, verse 11, these were more fair-minded than those in Thessalonica. And here's why. They received the word with all readiness and searched the scriptures daily to find out whether these things were true or not. Search the word of God. Spend time studying the word of God. Spend time just reading God's word. Amen. And I don't know if, if you're like me or not, but as I, I can read a passage of scripture and God reveals it to me in a certain way, another six months down the road I might be reading that same passage and he brings something new out yes. to me. Yes. It is so yes. exciting. Yes. And you know what that is? That's growing and maturing in God's word. In other words, those people in Thessalonica, they wanted to make sure that what they were taught was correct. You and I should be doing the same thing that they were doing back in those days. And then what I shared last week in James chapter 1, verse 22, is saying, but be doers of the word and not hearers only. You become mature in your walk with God by putting it into action in your life. If you hear it, and you know that a word is from God, then we need to put it into action. So go back to Acts chapter 17, verse 11. God complimented the church for their eagerness and their hunger for God's word. Again, put it into action. One person said, a mature church does stuff. That's how one person put it. Let me just give you an example of that. Not just doing stuff, but they have put what they hear into action. So here we go. God's word says, love your neighbor. They put it into action. God's word says to encourage one another. They put it into action. God's word says, love your enemies. Put that one into action. It says to bless them that curse you. Put it into action. Do good to them that hate you. Put it into action. So where it says in verse 15, grow up in all things, that is being eager to learn God's word, and that is putting into action what you hear. You know, your boss can tell you certain things all he wants, but until you put it into action, it doesn't mean a thing. The job won't get done. So it is with the scripture. We put into action what God speaks to our heart. Now, in every church, you have doers and you have not doers. Ever think of it that way? For lack of a better word? But the Bible in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 12 says that it warns the doers from comparing their works with adult doers. Pardon the lack of good English here. If you do that, you're doing stuff for the wrong reason. If you're comparing your works, if you're comparing what you're doing, God has spoke to your heart to do with those that aren't doing anything, you're doing it for the wrong reason. Why is that? We do what we do to please God. 
We don't do it to be recognized by man. We don't do it to be recognized by others. But we do it to glorify God. When God speaks to your heart about something in the Word of God and you begin to do, and you begin to grow and mature, you do that because you want to please your Heavenly Father. And as you learn that concept, you are maturing in your walk with God. The strength of the church depends on each and every one of us. We are all to grow up and mature into Christ, and we are all to edify and encourage the church. The poet wrote, I am only one, but still I am one. I cannot do everything, but I can do something. And because I cannot do everything, I will not refuse to do the something I can do. Amen. 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 Let's pray.